In this video, we're going to talk about the fallacy of composition, which is a common one you'll see occurring in many situations, in many sorts of scenarios. And we're going to talk about eight main things. First, we're going to talk about what the fallacy of composition actually is. Then we'll talk about the structure of argument, what it, it's laid out like. And then we'll talk about why it's a fallacy. After that, we'll talk about common situations where you can expect to see this sort of fallacy being, being made in argument or inference by people. We'll look at three examples of the fallacy. If you want to see other examples, we'll also have videos specifically just on examples of this fallacy and other fallacies. We'll talk about how to spot this. What are the red flags that, that you should be looking for in people's uh, reasoning, people's communication, in, in other types of inference? Uh, we'll also talk, and this is very important for those of you who are watching these videos to, to work on your critical thinking for classes where you have to take tests, what other fallacies it tends to get mistaken for. You don't want to mix this up with certain other fallacies. And then finally, we'll talk about how you can avoid making or falling into this fallacy in your own thinking, in your own reasoning. Uh, very important topic. So, what is the fallacy of composition? At its most basic, in every case where the fallacy of composition is being made. What's going on is that somebody is arguing that because the parts which they know something about that comprise a whole, which we're talking about, because those parts possess some sort of property, the whole, which is composed of those parts, likewise possesses that property. And this is not a problem in every single case. It's a problem when this is not the case when we have no reason to suppose that it is the case, especially with certain types of properties. So there will be some holes where we can, in fact, reasonably infer, because we know something about the parts, some property of the whole. But there will be others where that's not good reasoning. What is the structure of the fallacy? How is the fallacy laid out? You notice that I have here two premises and a conclusion. And in the brackets, I have what's being assumed, the, what we call an implicit premise, something that's not being stated explicitly. So let's look first at that, because that's really the Achilles heel of this fallacy. It's part of what makes it fallacious reasoning. It's a premise, so it's part of what we're laying out as the reasons for believing the conclusion would be true. And this premise runs when parts of a whole have a property, the whole also has that property. Now, is that always the case? It's not always the case. Perhaps we could say that in most cases it's the case, or at most times, in most situations. In that case, we're going from deductive to inductive argumentation. But even with that, it could still be a fallacy. We don't want to make assumptions about how parts and wholes relate to each other in terms of the properties of the parts and the properties of the whole that commit us to too much. That's what this fallacy in effect does. Now when we look at the other parts that are explicit, the, the first premise is the parts of whole A, we're just calling the whole A here, has the property X. The conclusion is whole A actually has the property X. So you notice what we're doing is we're starting with the parts and we're saying those parts have the property, therefore the whole has the property. What gets us there is that middle premise. And if that middle premise fails, then the argument fails. This is what we call an unsound deductive argument, the way that we have it framed right now. It could also be a uh, non-cogent inductive argument if we reformulated it slightly, introducing you know probability or likelihood or things along those lines. But that's getting a little bit more complex than we want to get to at this point. Now let's make it even more basic. It, can we chart out what this fallacy looks like? Yes, in fact, we can. And those arrows would actually be, in this case, those middle premises, that middle premise that's, that's unstated. Notice we have parts. These could be two parts. These could be 100 parts. It doesn't really matter how many parts we have. So long as we're saying that all these parts have this property X, and then we're reasoning from that, to say that the whole also has property X. That's our conclusion. Why is this a fallacy? 
Well, the weak point of this is that it ignores the fact that some properties can belong to parts of a whole without therefore belonging to the whole that's composed of those parts. And we're attracted to doing this sort of reasoning because we like to go from what's known to what's less well known and parts and wholes seem to be you know quite quite connected they're parts of a whole and so we think well we know something about these parts therefore we must know something about the whole what we have to do is we have to be a bit more careful in our reasoning we have to look at each property to see whether it's the sort of thing that we can say about both parts and whole whether if we want to use another sort of spatialization of this Think of the, the parts as being at the lower level and the whole as being at the higher level. Is what we can say about the lower level true when we move to the higher level? If not, then we're looking at a fallacy. So what are some common situations in which this is going to occur? Well, situations where we're reasoning about parts and wholes and about their properties and where we're not being careful. So let's think about what are the sort of situations in which we would be concerned with this kind of reasoning? What are holes that are composed of parts? I give you a number of examples here of you know, general categories. Organic bodies, you know, my hand, for example, is composed of fingers and flesh and sinews and nerves and all sorts of things. And it's also part of my body. So you notice that, that holes can also be part of larger holes. Um, machines are mechanisms. They have, they have all sorts of parts. They could be moving parts or non-moving parts, but they are parts. Organizations or teams, think, for example, of a, uh, you know, in the military, we have, again, all sorts of holes that are built into larger holes. So you can start out with individual people and assemble them into fire teams. Fire teams are parts of squads. You add something else in there as well. Squads are parts of platoons. Platoons are parts of companies. Companies are parts of battalions. Battalions are parts of, uh, you know, various things. It could be regiments. It could be um, brigades. Now it starts to get a little bit more complicated, right? Um, collections. You notice I have a, a collection of books behind me. Here's the Loeb Library, and I have quite a few of these green books are Aristotle. Some of them are also Lucian or some other things as well. That's a collection. Institutions. Uh, a university would be an institution. Movements, you know, a uh, Occupy Wall Street was a movement. The Tea Party is a movement. These are holes that are composed of parts. Countries, another example of holes. Notice, like I put here as well, that we've just created another hole by grouping together these different kinds of holes. So there's a little self-referentiality there. Now let's look at some examples. So one example would be a collection of music, or you could think of, you know, collections of books. So here's a very simple example. Every song in my iTunes music library is fairly short, no longer than 20 minutes. I may have some longer ones, I don't really know, but I think they're all pretty much shorter than that. Therefore, my whole music library is shorter than 20 minutes. This is an easy one to see that this can't possibly be, be right. There's something wrong with this reasoning, isn't there? And what's going wrong with it? Well, we're saying that the individual units because every single individual unit has this characteristic of length, a certain you know, portion of length, therefore the thing that we're putting together out of them is actually of the same length, it has the same quality. And we know that that's not the case in terms of this because when we put together a collection and we're talking about you know, quantity, we're adding quantities together. So uh, clearly in this case it's not going to work. Let's look at another example, a sports team. This sort of reasoning goes on all the time, not only with sports teams, but with projects, with offices. The idea is we'll take the best and the brightest of a particular thing, a dream team, and we'll put them all together, and that's going to be the best team for whatever it is that we're doing. Um, there's a lot of movies that are based on this, aren't there? And if you think about it, why can't we, why can't we infer that necessarily... I mean, the parts are all great. The parts are all high caliber, top of their game. But sometimes it depends on how you put the parts together. So the inference, therefore the flippers will be the best and definitely beat all the other teams in the league, 
you can't be sure of that. It could be that the best players may actually interfere with each other. Perhaps they're all prima donnas. Perhaps they only work well when they have other players to assist them. Let's look at a third example now. Automobiles. This is an interesting idea. You're going to take your car to uh, trade it in, and you go to the dealership, and it's a 2002 car, but you've replaced every single part. Now, I understand this would be a very far-fetched scenario, but imagine that you'd, at one time or another in the recent history, say the last year, you replaced every part. So every part in your car is pretty new. The engine's pretty new. All the parts of the engine are pretty new. The transmission, the, the, the wheels, the axle, the, you know, you name it, all the way down to the quarter panels and the, uh, you know, the switches for the, the automatic uh, windows. Does that mean that your car is pretty new? Well, try that. Try taking it to a dealership and they'll spot the fallacy very quickly. They'll say, no, it's still a 2002 car. You've just put it together, you know, you've essentially done a ship of Theseus putting together all these parts, and it's, it's in a certain sense no longer the same car, but the title says that this is a 2002 whatever, so your car is pretty old. Um, so those are some, some useful examples. Now let's think about how we would spot the fallacy of composition in the wild, so to speak, in, in our day-to-day um, back and forth discussions with people. So when you see arguments being made going from the parts to the whole that's composed of those parts, what I want you to do is to pay close attention to the property about which the claims are being made. Don't worry so much at first about the parts in the whole, whether these are parts of the whole. Look at that property. Think about whether that property is something that you can transfer from parts to a whole or whether there could be some, some problems, some obstacles, some reasons why you should say no in that case. Also, keep an eye out for cases in which what is true on one level is not necessarily true on the other level. This is really another way of saying the same sort of, uh, same sort of caution. Now, What's not the fallacy of composition? What do people often mix it up with? I'm going by what I've seen students do over and over again. There's another fallacy that's very similar to it, except it's going in the opposite direction. The, the fallacy of composition is going from the parts to the whole. It's composing. It's going from the less complex to the more complex. The fallacy of division is going in the exact opposite direction. It's taking the whole and breaking it down, dividing it into its parts and saying what we can say about the whole is therefore true about the parts. So you don't want to mix that up. And that's just a matter of, you know, which way it's going. Is it going from the whole to the parts or the parts to the whole? Another one that people often mistake for composition is hasty generalization. Here the difference is whether you are, you're talking about all the parts or just some or a few of the parts. So if we're, you know, here's a great example. If we're looking at the military and people want to generalize about what soldiers are like and they've met three or four soldiers, now they draw some, some big generalization about what, what the soldiers are like or what the army itself is like, that's a hasty generalization. If, on the other hand, you look at all of the soldiers, or at least most of them, and then you draw some sort of conclusion about the army, now you're engaging in the fallacy of composition. So in that case, the difference has to do with how many of the parts are you looking at. One other thing to keep in mind, not every argument that's going from parts to the whole is going to be a fallacious argument. You don't want to get in the habit of once you've got, you know, the fallacy of composition in your arsenal of, you know, whipping it out in, in every case where somebody goes from the parts of the whole, because there are a lot of cases where you can actually legitimately talk about a quality being had by the parts as evidence for why the quality would be had by the whole. How do you avoid making the fallacy of composition in your own discussions, in your own reasoning, in your own argumentation? So here's a rule of thumb. When you're reasoning about parts and wholes, ask yourself, 
is the property that I'm making a claim about something that is always or usually true of a whole because it's true of those parts? Or is it perhaps not that kind of property? Is it something that could be just sometimes the case? Or is it something that doesn't apply to holes, but only to parts? That'll help you out. Another thing that you can do is keep in mind what being brought together in certain kinds of holes adds to the parts. So, you know, a team would be a great example of this. Um, when we're bringing together players in a team or particular people in an office, or think about military units as well. Military units are more than just the sum of their parts. What else is going in there? And does that other thing that's going in there change it so that you can't say the same thing about the whole as you can about the parts? This is, you know, these are two rules of thumb that you can use to improve your own thinking and your own reasoning about, about holes and parts. This series uh, and the channel, the last thing that I'm going to say, this video is part of a series uh, which are all going to discuss common fallacies in reasoning and argument. It belongs to a channel devoted specifically to critical thinking, reasoning, and argumentation. I'm going to be adding a lot of videos over the next uh, several months and years to this channel. If you enjoy this video or you find it useful, share it with other people. Um, come back to the channel, check it out. I'm going to be continually adding more and more content. So there's going to be other videos and there's going to be other series. If you're interested in becoming a better thinker, a better reasoner, a better arguer, this is a, a very good resource to keep coming back to.